Hello, and welcome to the Proactive Caregiving Podcast. As a CPA with over 20 years as an industry accountant, Jessica stepped away from the corporate world to become a full-time caregiver for her mother. Having learned invaluable lessons along the way, she is now here to share those with you and to invite you to join her on this caregiver's journey. Here is your host, Jessica Cannon. Hello, everybody. It is so good to be back. I cannot express that enough. Um, This is our welcome back episode. And before we go into it, I just wanted to let those of you who don't know me, um, I am the proactive caregiver, and I specialize in educating others on how to be proactive by empowering you, the caregiver. So today's episode (laughs) is going to be a bit of a rehash for us because I want to share the story, the journey we have gone through this last couple of months. For those of you who don't know, my guest that's joining me with today is going to be my producer, husband, and friend, and I thought it was fitting for him to be here because not only was I the caregiver prior to, but I became the care recipient, and our roles switched in that respect. So, thank you for coming on with me today, Scott. Thank you. It's it's interesting to be on this side of the the camera and computer. I'm usually... In the other room. Uh, You're not in my yeah. ear. It's, it's actually good because um, also to kind of recap a little bit. So for, vo- for those that don't understand or know, um, I actually had to have surgery, back surgery last April. Uh, we mentioned a little bit of it, but what I didn't mention at the time was the lead up, the build up to it. And that's something that because I was in the moment, which I feel that a lot of caregivers go through when you're in the moment, you don't realize the extent of everything, the the depth, and we get into that mode of just mulling through, just making it by day by day, which is what I was doing. Um, To the point that even my own personal physical pain, I was pushing through that and pushing myself well beyond what I should have. So, And even at times when you would give me advice and be careful, don't do this. In my mind, I was like, sure, I can do this. Yeah. Well, and we as humans, I think, have a tendency to do that, especially with exercising and working out. You know, if I just do a little bit more, I'll get a little bit better, a little bit faster. Yeah. Um, But sometimes those, those, uh, if you don't take the steps incrementally, it it can have uh, undesired consequences. Right. And... I didn't take that advice and I didn't listen. And so even a few days before my surgery, um, knowing what was needing to be done, having two lower vertebrae replaced, uh, I still continued to exercise until that one, my L4-5, which um, if you're not aware of or familiar with it, it's the vertebrae right above the sacral. And that one ruptured and not being able to walk or yeah. go to the restroom or well, I remember the one night when it when it actually ruptured you went to roll over you're like laying on the floor watching TV you went to roll over and there was that pop very odd and yes. it was just this I mean you could I mean you could hear it and you could see visibly the pain that went through your body your face like you knew in that moment that something was not right yes and from right. from that point on yeah just even walking across the room was was a task yeah i could barely walk i was hobbling across the room couldn't walk couldn't sit down could could barely lay down yeah yeah it was just constant pain and so the idea of that it's okay it'll be corrected through surgery to me it was it was just something i had to do it was another step i had to go through what i didn't expect was the feeling afterwards waking up after the surgery was done and being completely dependent, going from a very independent, very active, yeah. to being completely dependent on everyone, and especially you, for so much. I mean, at some point he was feeding me. I couldn't lift my head. It's you know, the first few days, especially after the first few days. Um, yeah, once we got you in the bed, that's pretty much where you, where you had to stay because getting up was a chore. I mean, it was right. painful for you still because right. you, 
it was an anterior and posterior. So it wasn't just on the back. She had, they had to go into the front as well as the right. back. So it was a double whammy. Because when you sit up, when you do a lot of things, you use your core without exactly. even realizing it. Exactly. So, even me being so yeah. fluent with the yoga and the exercise that I was doing that I didn't realize just right. how much those core muscles were yeah. gone. So even just to sit up, to even try to eat was, was painful for the first few days. Yeah. So, so yeah, we were spoon feeding. <laughs> yes, and I stayed upstairs for uh, two weeks because for, you know, get lifting my head to eat, let alone getting yeah. up and out of the bed to go to the bathroom or shower, the stairs was not in the cart yeah. for two, at least yeah. two weeks. But this well, process... It, even, even a simple task like that would take for granted just going to the bathroom. Uh, that would take yes. us 15, 20 minutes just to get her to the bathroom to, to pee and come back. I mean, it was because, again... With the incisions in the front and the back, to just to get up out of bed was right. was painful. So, right. and this was not only a physical pain; it was an emotional pain for me because at that point, that's when I started to really hone in on what this feeling of loss of independence means and what it what it's like. And yeah. I couldn't going through this. Of course, part of my recovery in the very early part of it was trying to keep myself from falling into that poor me and being the victim here, but the victim of having to be dependent. But it kept me in also that mindset of thinking of, wow, this is also what mom was going through in several of her stages, especially the first few times I actually had to help her in the bathroom and wipe her. And I kept thinking it was a very... Um, embarrassing moment for me Uh, I know being married and the level of intimacy we've had over the years it still was incredibly different and I couldn't help but to feel that that pushback of no I've got this no I can do this by myself but I couldn't and I knew I couldn't and I needed you I had to have you and so it was just a complete surrender of... Yeah, but you, you know, and we've had this conversation, in, in those situations, especially us, we've been, mar- been married 20, 20 years, they've been together 21 years. Um, it's like, if, if you're a parent, you know, when you have a baby, and the, the you know, that first few months of the tar poop comes out, you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but when it's your baby, it's, it's okay. Yeah. It's different. It's not gross, because it's your baby. Well, you're my baby. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't... It, it wasn't gross, if that makes right. sense. It was different because I, you know, you're my baby. <laughs> Part of it was I knew what it was for me. Yeah. I knew um, I didn't want you to have to do those kind of things. And in my mind, I kept thinking that wouldn't come up for decades, yeah. that I wouldn't be in the position that I would need such care. Yeah. But it was comforting that you came into, you stepped into that role, and it. Um, part of my mind was, oh gosh, he's seen that part of me in a way he hasn't seen it before. But then I forgot. Well, he was there when our son was born, <laughs> yeah. and so he yeah. got to see all of the details. But I didn't want. I didn't want to relinquish that. Yeah. Control. I know what you mean. I I, I get it because as an you know. A, when you're able to do things on your own, 99.9% of the time, when you're down for that, even temporarily, it's like when you get a cut on your pinky, you never notice your pinky until you until you, you can't, can't use, use your pinky. <laughs> um, but on, on my side of it, though, it's just I want you to be better. I want you to feel better to not hurt. So, yeah, if we have to do these things, then we have to do these things. And Right. So, yeah. And the interesting thing is while I'm laying in bed and trying to allow my body to re recover and countless individuals that were so great in in giving me encouragement would always say get some rest get some rest and getting that rest almost on command telling you to get rest uh, again it reminded me of how many situations I was in and it's Mm -hmm. easier to say it and tell someone than it is to actually be in that that mind space and be able to get the rest because we're used to doing things we're used to exactly and knowing on, on my side of this, uh, knowing what burnout looks like, watching you step in and not only help me in this vulnerable place, but take over 
everything. I mean, he was cooking, he was cleaning, he was doing laundry and working still full time and trying to balance all of it. I was worried that he was going to get sick and that burnout would pass over to him. And then what am I going to do? Yeah. Then I would be stressed because now I need to, I would feel like I need to get better faster so I can take care of him. And, and it just kind of that back and forth. And right. Wanting to care for the other. And but that's, but when you're in a relationship, in a partnership, that's, that's what you do. And that's the mentality that I was taking all this time with yeah. mom and not really understanding that until I myself was in yeah. that position of dependency. And, and that's where that fine line comes in of, of wanting to do these things, but knowing your limits right. while you're doing those things. Because there was one day where I, I kind of got... I kind of got down. I kind of got lightheaded because I was just pushing, pushing, pushing. And, and you called me out on it. You're like, no. Because this is to a point, this is a few weeks in where she, she could get around a little bit more. And she's like, no. She actually called me out to go sit down and, yeah. yeah. So. Right. And at that point, I was already fighting back to, I, I need my yeah. independence. I want my independence. <laughs> and pushing him back to say, you need to relax and take a break, take a breather. It was that thought in my mind with mom of, huh, maybe all those times that she pushed me away wasn't exactly that personal, which it's hard in that moment to not take some of that personally because you're just, you love your care, your loved one, the person you're caring for, and you just want to do the most and the best for them. Right. And it's hard to get that rejection in a way, but now I see it because I almost wanted to <laughs> close the bathroom door sometimes like, no. And then you gradually started to close the door on your own and give me return the privacy. And it just start, slowly started to get back to what I felt as our normal. Yeah. But in knowing it was a peace of mind, too, knowing in that moment that you were there, you stepped in in a way that I never expected you to have to. Mm -hmm. And in ways that I never <laughs> thought you would have what, to. Wanted me to. <laughs> oh, so it's... But it's interesting you say that, though, you know, in referencing it with your mother in those same situations, because like you said, some of those are um, uncomfortable for you or embarrassing for you as a person having to, to need that kind of help. Yeah. I didn't see it that way, but of course, I wasn't the one having in that situation. Right. So it's, it's interesting to kind of put yourself in the other person's shoes. Right. You know, yeah, I'm thinking I'm just doing this to help you because right now you surgery, you need the help. I just let's just get it done. Let's just just do it. Exactly. But for you, <clears throat> excuse me, it is that invasion of personal space. You know, so it's it, it's interesting to like you said to put it, spin that perspective and look at it from her point of view. And even though she's saying you know get away or whatever, it may not be because she doesn't want you there. No. It's it's just that. Because I had to admit to myself at that yeah. point that I need help. And I know many caregivers can relate to this. It's hard. Mm -hmm. It is really hard to say, I need help. It's hard to receive. And in this scenario, I had no other choice. Yeah. I had to receive. Because otherwise, not only would I not get a shower or go to the bathroom, I wasn't going to get fed <laughs> uh, without food all over me either. Because yeah. that happened too yeah. when I tried to do it myself. <laughs> But in that moment, I realized it has nothing to do with age. You know, it, I kept telling myself whenever mom would respond in some of the ways, um, defensively or a little bit more than that, um, it's just because she's the older adult and this is her younger daughter telling her what to do. And it really has nothing to do with age. It's that relinquishing control yeah. and having that dependency and independent, just the lines blurred and just having things done for you, um, my legs at some point being lifted for me was just bizarre. Well, and you know, to that end, a lot of the older generation, we, the way they were raised, we even, even to some extent, our generation were raised where you do things on your own. Yeah. You build your own path, you make your own way. You, exactly. you build this, you do it. And so to suddenly have to be like, I can't, I need you to do this for me, it's very, um, I lost the word, but it's, it takes you out of that seat of power. It's demeaning at some point because it's, I felt, um, like I was, I don't want to say hopeless, but at the same time I felt, and that's where that victim, the idea of the victim yeah. came in because I felt like 
my my personal power was gone. Well, raised Which to believe, not, yeah. But physically, if I can't get up by myself to reach over and get a glass of water, right. or to uh, get a remote for the TV, or get up out of the bed gradually, knowing I have to go to the bathroom and how long it's going to take me to get up out of the bed to get to the bathroom in time, yeah. you know. It's just those concepts, like now I see why mom had a lot of the issues she did when it came to toileting um, and needing the help to get to the bathroom mm-hmm. and making it there in time. Because it wasn't until I lived it that those flashes of mom daily and day out just made more sense. Yeah. And then on top of this, so it, it gets a little more interesting because when I was three weeks, four weeks into this, Hmm. finally regaining my strength finally getting up and out of the house and slowly making it down the stairs things changed because then I had my first ever experience and I hope you never deal with this but part of my concern with mom was her sedentary and not getting up and moving and blood circulation was one thing but blood clots so I had an experience with a pulmonary embolism and that was the scariest thing ever beyond the back surgery. Yeah. Because fighting for air, I can't even express that. It's, it's, was, it is one of my fears. If I think about, you know, if you've ever had that conversation, when I die, I hope I just pass in my sleep. I used to have nightmares of drowning in water and suffocating underwater. And that nightmare came to life. Yeah. That was, it was very scary. In fact, I mean, I think you almost have more pain from the PE than you did from the surgery itself. Yes, exactly. Because there was one one of the first nights, maybe after the first trip to the doctor, uh, trying to get her into the bed because she couldn't lay flat. She had to stay sitting up. Yeah. And I mean, you, the, it was just the heartbreaking. Was the, the, the 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 expression of just sheer pain. It's hard to face. see your loved one in that pain yeah. and not and be able to do can't, anything. Yeah, and you can't do a thing. And a lot of times us guys, we're kind of raised and we're told, you know, you fix stuff. You, If something's broke, you fix it. If the, if your woman needs help, you help her. And when that situation happens and there's just, there's nothing you can do. Right. Yeah. It's, it was scary because after watching my own father uh, kind of pass over a three-week period from pneumonia, and going from oxygen mask to a tracheotomy, a lot of those thoughts started to go into my mm, mind. Sure of, what does this mean for me? What Am I going to have a weakened immune system going forward? Am I going to need a tracheotomy? At one point I thought, thankfully I didn't. Uh, but that moment of fighting for air yeah. and realizing I might suffocate or pass and all the things, all the conversations I want to have with friends and family and loved ones that hadn't been had at that point and hadn't been expressed was that, oh my gosh. Right. The other thing about it too that was, that was surprising, um, was this is about, like you said, a month after the surgery Mm -hmm. and she was doing so much better. We were taking walks, you know, up and down the street here, getting outside. And I mean, she was able to get up and down. Um, tenderly, but she could get up and down. But she's, she was getting back to um, almost a normal routine, kind of. Yeah. And then this happened. And Ironically. you want to go into the details of that? Ironically, because once I finally started to regain that control, that feeling of independence was coming back and stepping outside and getting the fresh air and yeah. walking. And, and we were going on further and further walks throughout the day and just feeling so good to have this moment of suddenly wait a minute i can't it, it, it hurts when i breathe and the back brace that i was wearing i thought am i wearing it too tight am i wearing it wrong maybe it was too tight and i sneezed or something and maybe i pulled a muscle i just again i kept explaining it away yeah. which i fear that so many people do that because we don't want to think the worst of it we don't want to know that reality and so When I made the phone call to the doctor's office, to the surgeon, and said, is there any possible way that I would be wearing this brace wrong? Um, She had said no, but you might want to contact your doctor just to be on the safe side. Because when she asked, what are your symptoms? 
well, I'm having a really hard time breathing. I can't get a deep breath. I can't, it was just shorter and shorter breaths. And by the time we made it to the doctor's office and got in for it, the doctor calmly said, I don't want to alarm you, but pulmonary embolisms yeah. are serious. You need to go straight to the emergency room. You need to get seen immediately. And when you go to check in, you tell them at checkout that you have a PE because you get bumped to the top of the list. Yeah. And so that's kind of what happened. We went from the doctor's office straight to the, straight ER. To the ER, checked in. I told him exactly what he told me. And I went back right away and they from that the, point on it just they did the CT scan to confirm that she had a small pulmonary embolism in right her right lung and it felt like so at this point I know I can't words don't do this pain justice but it felt like a nail was being driven every deep breath that I tried to take it felt like a nail was driving through my rib cage and out through the back so if I needed to lay down it felt like the nail was being shoved further through and almost like a nail from the back to the front was going through. So my, my lungs weren't expanding the way they were needing to, but fear, trying not to be afraid and trying to show that I'm okay. It, all of that went out the door when I couldn't get a breath in. That was the, that was the Monday. That was Monday. And they gave her, they gave her some morphine for the pain. And um, and it's Zarelto, and sent which is the blood thinner, home. and they sent us home. And that was the night when we got home and tried to she tried to lay down in bed that night. That's the night that the pain was so bad that her face was just you could see it. And then the next morning, I remember I cried. Yeah, and I never cried, even when my back ruptured, even when I woke up from the surgery. I never cried for yeah. any of that pain, but this was in. Hence. And then the next morning, she got up, showered, and made her way downstairs. By the time she got downstairs, um, she she had to sit down. And she could she could say a word. Or she could barely speak because she couldn't take a breath. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, where they get either you get in the truck now or I'm making the call. And all she did because she was sitting in the chair, she just goes, call. <laughs> That's all she could out. get out. And so we called 911 and. Yeah, that, that they came and and took us back to the hospital, and then we spent what four days? Four or five days, I think I was in there. So that was Monday. I was in Tuesday morning, and I didn't get home or checked out until Saturday afternoon. Yeah, so they had her on oxygen for about days. three or four of those days, and until the the Israel took the blood thinner had time to to do its job. And of course, they did more CT scans. They did more. Um, What's the other one called? Ultrasounds. This ultrasounds. Thank you. To make sure I didn't have any yeah, clots to in my check. arms, my legs. To make sure nothing else was going to be a hidden, yeah, hidden emergency. But that, even in that moment, it set my recovery back. It did. I had to start all over again. Yep. Because now I had to allow my body to heal in a different way. That that breath being able to get that breath and you don't realize it but the core muscles from the surgery now being affected so getting up having to use that core muscle and the exertion of getting up and once i was able to get up then it was because i was out of breath yeah and i couldn't talk and that's i'm a talker yeah (laughs) and it was amazing having to be quiet for a change but feeling like this cannot be my new ways of yeah. life and it wasn't going to be but in that moment and that's all you know from that moment it's hard to look past yeah. that when you just want the pain to go away you just want to be able to take that breath and it's something we just we take for granted yeah and it's another moment that reminded me walking with mom and trying to get her to take short walks outside to get the fresh air come on mom let's go get the fresh air and realizing the over a period of time she gradually had some more weight put on and that in itself makes it hard to walk and breathe sometimes and walking with her and seeing her just be winded from that same motion of trying to get yourself up and standing just to walk to the restroom and that and just to be so incredibly out of breath it was like wow i experienced it and i thought this is what mom goes through 
every day. Mm -hmm. And it was just my temporary moment to get through. Thankfully, I am long past that. Um, talking and breathing and able to do more than yeah. I thought I could in that moment that I was going to be able to. Yeah, once we got past the PE, the recovery has been, I mean, she's 98%. I mean, so part of that recovery, and I do have to give credit uh, to the level for all you artists out there that understand what creativity does for us. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that before, and I have some episodes going forward that we were going to talk a little bit more about that level of creativity and what it does. It really is that food for the soul, so to speak. Yeah. And so coming out of this, the surgery and the PE and, and getting the recovery, finally getting it back going and rolling, um, we had a chance to work on a movie production together and I had the one side of my mind saying, don't do it, you can't, you can't breathe, you can't walk, you can just the negative side of it. And then there was the other side that said, you've got to do this, do this and do it well. And you've got the energy and you will get that energy and every moment you need it because God and all the angels in the world are watching over you. And it was something amazing that that level of creativity um, healed yeah. way faster yeah and i didn't have a moment to think about <laughs> the, the victim it was just go go we were go too busy working so she says that she's underplaying it a little bit though because our so i've done a few other films so i kind of had a little bit of an idea what was going to happen but this one <laughs> our our first week was actually an, an exterior location so we were outside in a field for the in a couple different fields for the first like five days of the production and I, I was a little concerned about how, how you would do out there. But I'll tell you what, guys, she's a trooper. She got out there, and she was she killed it. She crushed it. I was, I was so proud. I was so impressed. Because um, we're walking all over these fields, and we're having to move yes. stuff back and forth. And the doctor told her before, no more than 8 to 10 pounds. And, of course, she did you know go gentle and easy, but there were times where she was picking stuff up and carrying it across and... Yeah, I was I was, was real proud and, and very of, impressed. And I I love that that you were there with me because for you to do things for me, I had by that point had become accustomed to it and was used to and, and accepting. Yeah. But having to ask someone else, now there are there was a, a crew of at least twenty to twenty two crew mm -hmm. on the on the set daily and having to ask someone, could you carry my chair over here for me? I felt like that that well, was again coming back to that um but it wasn't just a, like a little chair you got to oh, explain right. that this okay. was a big this was a big <laughs> chair that had like stuff attached to it because she was our script supervisor on this on this production so she had a full-on binder of like 200 some odd pages of stuff so carry my time. chair <laughs> define that a little bit it's it was a big chair with oh, stuff okay. in it so it wasn't so it? this chair was a fisherman's <laughs> chair and the reason we got it was because it had a cooler attached to the side so i could mm -hmm. keep water bottles in there and snacks and whatnot and then it had pockets on the other side it. that you put your binder yeah, and stuff so it in. wasn't just a little chair but having to ask for that yeah. help and not being able to just pick it up myself and go. And there were times I tried and, and leaning forward and lifting and I felt it right away. My body said no. So putting it down and then having to say, could you move this for me? Could you grab my yeah. backpack? And I, if he was there, he would do it right away. I didn't have to ask. But what if he was off on a different side of the set and elsewhere and I did have to ask somewhere else, it was that same thing in my mind that was really hard to ask someone for help and be okay yeah. with it and show a level of vulnerability and knowing and they knew what i had gone through they yeah. knew what i was recovering from and they were amazed but to me i was just back my mind switched i was back in survival mode but i know now that that survival mode can be misleading because again there could be those cues that our body says no <laughs> And we push past those. But this time on this flip end of it, after having the pulmonary embolism and going through all that, when I felt those bodily cues, I listened. Yeah. That, that was, it's very important to listen to your body. And because of that, I mean, to go in, even further into the production, by the time production wrapped, 
because you listen to your body, you're able to do a little bit more as we went along. By the time we got to, to rap, you were able to carry your backpack, which was, again, to qualify this, this was a heavy backpack with the binders and everything she had in it. Right. So, I mean, by the time we got there, I think because you listened and because you know your body, you're able to take those baby steps, to use the term, right. to, to gradually get back to a point where... But before we got to that point, we were two weeks into this production, Mm. running ragged yeah. it was the craziest outrageous amazing fun experience <laughs> but we burned that candle at both ends yeah yeah the time demand was there uh we hit the day schedules and within two weeks both of us got sick yeah and when we got sick you know like head cold nothing um virus or covid related in any way but it's summer heat, Texas heat. I mean, we had that head cold mm-hmm. from heat exhaustion as well. And at that point, I realized, doggone it. I'm the proactive caregiver. I know better. How did I not see this coming? Well, some of those days I wasn't listening to my body. Yeah. Some of those days I wasn't drinking enough fluids. Some of those days I probably had more uh, sugar for that boost of energy than I needed. And Dang it, crap services. <laughs> no, don't say that. It just, it got to the point that it was the alarm bells going off. You know what your body needs. You know how to fuel it. Yeah. Get back on track. And once we did, I finished the rest of this. We finished the rest of this strong because the energy came back. Yeah. And it was the definite reminder how you've got to fuel your body. And if you're going on a hiking trip... I've said before, you, you bring water at the very least, but if you go and you plan on these, especially if you're planning on overnight stays, you prepare for it. It doesn't matter what you're working on. These items, these topics, the, the answers to all those questions bring true. We had to prepare for it. And so the last week and a half, we did much better on preparing yeah. for it and, and keeping ourselves strong. And so we got through it together and... I honestly feel like doing that instead of staying home and feeling sorry for myself, um, it pushed the recovery time into high gear. I I believe that 100% as well. And then when I was going back for my three month checkup and actually saw the x-rays, which uh, there will be a picture on the blog for you to see, as I saw the picture and seeing the back healing, it was in my mind, it gave myself that all of a sudden the victim evaporated, it was gone. I am strong. And all those other affirmations that I had done prior years through yoga, it came right back. I am strong. I am capable. I am all of that. I can do this. I am yep. healthy. I am just kept going through the back brace was came off and I just felt the day each day more and more strength because now it wasn't just the physical strength that I was getting the emotional the mental strength all of that came yeah. out hearing the hearing the surgeon look at an x-ray and say it's beautiful this is perfect it's exactly what yes. you want it to be yes. it is reassuring and reaffirming you yeah. and being able to even just sit here right now with you and pain free pain free <laughs> no more sciatic nerve um, problems and issues that I was having having at that time it is just incredible and like everything else it's not until you re- take the time to look back and reflect mm-hmm. to see I had no reason to worry but I know that now in the moment back then yeah I, I was worried, what if I can't walk normal? What if I don't get my swagger back? What if I can't do a number of things? What if I can't get back to doing my yoga? And that's slowly coming back. I'm slowly being able to do my exercises. I'm not completely recovered because this fusion yeah. process takes at the very least six months. I'm yeah. halfway through that, just over that halfway mark. And over the next, the rest of this year, I'm just going to get stronger physically yep. because... I know what to do to proactively keep my body healthy, my mind healthy, 
and knowing that I have a caregiver in training um, <laughs> and no longer feeling that fear of, you know, I know um, when it's the parent and the child, it's one thing, but when it's the spouse taking care of the spouse, um, we see the good, the bad, the ugly, the ugh, and the ah <laughs> moments. It's just, it makes a difference. And being able to support each other in different ways. Yeah. And being able to observe and see my loved one's heading into a direction. Because I know he was just thinking about caring for me at one point and completely forgot about himself. That's what so many of us do as caregivers. Just, yeah, she, she was a skull. I taught you better than that. <laughs> yes, yes. And it's, it's one thing to know it. Yeah. It's another thing to apply it. And even when you know it and you apply it, I've lived it, you can still forget it in the moment. Yeah. However demanding your moments are, it, and it's that possibility, but hopefully you have something or someone that's able to say, hey, yeah. you forgot. Yeah, you know, it's 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 very true. You know, like you said, well, I was working at the same time too, um, and fortunately, this was just a temporary situation. Yeah. For a lot of folks, it's not temporary. Right. And and so, luckily, when I when I did kind of get to that point, um, you were able to put me back on track, and I was able to recover myself. But there are a lot of people who maybe not don't have that option because it's not a right. temporary situation, and that's when they need to find help from outside resources and not be ashamed to ask for that help because those resources are there for a reason. So. Right. See, and one of the things that came to mind right away while we were in the middle of the production was what were we eating? Mm. Yep. What, how frequently were we eating that? And being on the go, grab and go, we were kind of just grabbing and going and eating things either that we stopped eating before or things that weren't really giving us the type of energy we needed to yeah. s- sustain that stamina going. But once we got back on and giving him back to the types of the green salads and um, the teas even, drink the liquids that we were drinking, yeah. the fluids to keep us going, um, eating avocados. We were eating half of an avocado or a whole avocado at 2 a.m. just to have nourishment <laughs> yeah. and then go to bed. Yeah, there were some late nuts, yeah. Yes, but getting back to the basics and understanding that. Yeah. And for me, or for us, that was a that was a project. That was a temporary project mm-hmm. that, you know, had the beginning and end to it. But for the caregivers that are going through this day in, day out, it is, it is easy to forget. It is yeah. sometimes... The fatigue takes over. You are so exhausted and tired that you forget. You'd rather sleep, and that's what I saw mom do several times. She would rather sleep than get a decent meal. If, and if that's your only chance to sleep, sometimes you gotta take that, but you also have to remember that your body still needs that fuel, and the longer you're down sleeping, the more your body will naturally pull from your resources in your muscle and tissue. And if you're not replenishing that, you're going to get sick and weak and even more fatigued than you were before you took that nap or went to bed without dinner. Any of those kind of scenarios. Yeah. So it's important that, again, the boundaries, knowing them so that you can recognize them because it wasn't until I was sick that I finally snapped and realized I pushed myself past my boundaries. And then I was upset with myself. <laughs> We really did that. those first two weeks, and we did have a, a, a somewhat aggressive schedule. And it's it's not like you said it was temporary. It's not yeah. something we do all the time, uh, as far as uh, those kind of features. But you we you do have to be mindful, and we we did. We we totally skipped. We got into the project, and we got caught up, and we uh, we let our our diet that we knew we needed to maintain kind of go. And so yeah, and we paid we paid the price. <laughs> Well, and then after that, it was right, I kicked it right back into high gear again. It's time to meal prep. And yep. I started making the uh, overnight oats and the things that I know that are that are just as easy for the grab and go. Um, mm-hmm. I'm making my own salads to take and eat and getting the leafy green, the rich green salads and mixed vegetables with it. Too. And even just that avocado, like yes. you said. I mean, most people think of avocados just for guacamole or something. But no, you take that avocado and just 
I like them raw, just by themselves, I just ate them plain. Raw. And other times I had um, Himalayan salt or garlic salt oh, and pepper, and I would sprinkle that on there. And sometimes I want, I love the salty sweet stuff, so sometimes I would put honey in it with the garlic salt and pepper. Yeah. I know, yeah. he's not so much the salty <laughs> sweet. And other times uh, I just put it by itself or a, a sprinkle of the lemon juice or lime juice on mm. it. And just, it's the taste, it's the flavor. I mean, avocados give you so much. Yeah. You get the healthy fats from it. Your body can burn that energy and it's and amazing, it's different. But now we know going forward for the next couple of projects, before it even starts, I'm meal prepping yeah. and I'm gonna have this as often as I can to get through it, but uh, not to forget our body, you know, functions in a certain way. It needs certain things. Mm -hmm. And now as my recovery continues and it kind of, the way I started in the beginning, I see some of that becoming less and less and less. And I feel the energy coming back more and more and more. I feel the muscle tone coming back more and more. I'm able to do more. I'm able to um, drive again and, you know, do things that, that gave me my independence. And I know mom can't do that at this point. She continues to live her days uh, as in as best quality of life as possible, but... So, now that I know this is your show, but can I ask you a question? Absolutely. So with, with, so with all of this, do you think that's helped make you a better caregiver, put, put in, being in that position? Definitely, because now I know, I know what it feels like. Because it was one thing to tell mom to get rest. It was one thing to tell mom to eat something, um, knowing this is going to give her energy. It was one thing to see her, even after her own procedures, to not have the energy yeah. or the core strength. But to actually feel that and know what it's like to understand now that their reactions, her reaction was not something to take personally. Right. And we say it and we know it, but those responses still hurt. Yeah. They, they still broke my heart sometimes, but I had to learn that in this process, what it feels like to have that lack of dependence or independence and be dependent on someone else and understand what that feels like, looks like, and how to not feel like I'm out of control or I don't have control of my own body even. Yeah. Because I can't imagine what someone who is has lost control of their bowels, for example, and has to, uh, maybe they don't speak up as soon that they need uh, their bottoms changed because of embarrassment. Because I know I had moments that I didn't want to have to go to the bathroom and ask for help because that meant it was more embarrassment for me in the beginning. Yeah. But it, I think it helped me to see the flip side, to understand and know, okay, so maybe those reactions are not right. personal. It was, yeah. it, it was not a personal attack. It was the personal, their feeling of loss of independence. Yeah. So. Interesting. It is. And so as a caregiver and a care recipient, becoming that, I mean, it's one thing for your spouse. You say you, we get the vows till death do us part. Yeah. But it's an entirely different thing when you get into that moment because you don't, you don't say those vows with these scenarios in mind. At least yeah. I know I didn't. It'll never happen to us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And when it does, it yeah. is very demanding of your own body mm -hmm. and mind but it brought us closer together yeah it definitely taught me what it's like to be in that on that side and and be able to feel it and see it and there's times that i was resentful of my own mother because she wasn't taking care of herself and then what it was doing to her body but now Hindsight, seeing it, seeing where she is, and sometimes you don't have control over these situations, and you can't. You have to relinquish it. Yeah, and with a disease like like Alzheimer's and dementia, it can affect people in a thousand and one different ways. Right. Where they are just not aware. Yeah. Right. 
And so my biggest takeaway is the healing power of creativity. I mean, letting go and allowing someone else to receive, being able to receive the help is one thing, but the healing powers of creativity was an entirely different side that I never expected to be. So I'm looking forward for our next episode. Um, but I'm glad that I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad you finally got her in, in a, on a film set. And <laughs> so we threw it in the deep end with the scripty, and, and she did fantastic. Yeah, yes. it, was, it was great. Yeah, I had a little bit of a life reserve. But <laughs> <laughs> I was able to tread water, let's put it that way. So. You did a good job. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks for joining me today. Oh, I've, oh thanks for having me on. This, was, this has been fun. It's cool. good to be on this side of the camera. I yeah. know. Next time he'll be back in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in today. Um, I really am excited about this being the welcome back because I'm back, baby. We're going to keep moving forward. I hope this gave you some food for thought. And until next time, be proactive. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We really hope you've enjoyed this episode. To learn more about proactive caregiving and to hear other episodes of this podcast, please visit www.jessicalazelcannon.com. This podcast is produced by Canon Light Media, LLC, www.canonlightmedia.com. Music provided by Chris Paradise.